coming up on Broncos Country Connected. Lionel Bienvenu and Troy Rank discuss what's on tap for the final two weeks of OTAs and touch on the position battle that's already underway at the inside linebacker position. Then learn more about what game day is like for Miles the mascot and the kind of impact he hopes to have on Broncos country. Finally, the Broncos hosted 28 community projects during the Denver Day of Service. See how everyone came together to make a measurable impact right here in Colorado. Broncos Country Connected is next. Thanks for joining us for Broncos Country Connected. There are just two weeks left in the Broncos offseason workout program before the players take some much deserved time off before training camp begins at the end of July. Lionel Bienvenu and Troy Rank discuss expectations for these next two weeks and the team's expectations for the season. Lionel? Thanks, Alexis, and welcome to our Denver 7 segment brought to you by 1 800 Got Junk. Well, Ryan Harris is off this week, but Broncos insider Troy Rank is here to save the day. <laughs> <laughs> Troy, we are less than 100 days away from opening night in Seattle. Can't wait. Uh, but where are we now with OTAs and the install of the offense and the defense? I mean, everything is new and different. Uh, give us a progress report on the Nate Hackett, Russell Wilson era of Broncos football. Well, basically, when you get into this point of the offseason, you're just learning the terminology and you're repping plays. You're not putting the whole puzzle piece together yet. Install is more of a training camp process, and we should be able to see some of that at the end of the mandatory minicamp. But right now, basically, it's getting guys familiar with the terminology, how they're going to call things philosophically, but getting reps in, getting timing, and then as you get kind of like one part, one part, and then you put it together. So they're doing the things they need to do, but we're not going to see the real progress till training camp. Yeah, and another week of OTA practice this week, Troy, and meetings and it's really another week of seeing smiling faces and hearing laughter at Dove Valley. That's not going away. You would think with every week of practice, the grind of the offseason, things might get a little more serious, a little more tedious as we go along, but not yet. No, because Coach Nate Hackett won't let it. Josie Jewell was telling us the other day that they have an 8 a.m. meeting and Hackett comes in like he's on fire, like he is providing the energy. He is the plug in the outlet. And so when your coach has that type of energy and it's authentic, it bleeds into the room and he challenges them with Kahoot and these other things where you're basically learning and it's disguised as competition. So you learn it, but it also fosters this camaraderie. It's coming from the coach and it's coming from Russell Wilson. I had a former Broncos player tell me, Lionel, he hasn't seen that type of energy in OTAs for basically forever. Now we'll see, will it matter in the regular season? But right now the energy is real and the, it's authentic and I love it. We saw Russell Wilson uh, at practice, of course, also <laughs> posting pictures and video on social media of picture day. The players in full uniform. We saw Russell in his orange number three game jersey for the first time. But we've also seen Russell at the Grand Prix of Monaco at music award shows, uh, doing a lot of good things in the community at Children's Hospital at the Governor's Mansion last week. Troy, is there any worry here, any at all, that he might be stretching himself a little too thin, doing too many things off the field and not enough on the field. Listen, if it were me, I would be so thin you could fax me from studio to studio. Uh. I wouldn't even have to fly. Not Russell Wilson. His nickname, Mr. Unlimited. These are the types of things he does, Lionel. It's crazy. He told me he only sleeps four to five hours a night. He is calling his quarterback coach sometimes at 1.30 in the morning going over plays. He loves and is obsessed with football, but he fits in the other parts of his life, and that's not easy. But he's everywhere, and right now, it's not bothering him. And In fact, it's just kind of what his routine is, and it is crazy for anyone else it makes sense for Russell Wilson yeah uh, the football part is not suffering at all if you listen to his teammates saying that he knows everything <laughs> about everything about football and he knows every detail about everything as well yeah, and that's the thing that's so shocking is that a guy could be at the Children's Hospital traveling the globe, but and he's doing that, he's looking at basically an iPad. He's talking to his quarterback's coach. He's texting with his head coach. He's never untethered. It looks like to me when I've talked to players, he's never untethered from football, and that's how you win. When it's the most important thing to your best player, that is a great position for your team to be in. Well, we heard from Tim Patrick out of Dove Valley as well about how practice is going, how Russell is leading the charge on the field, in the meeting room, in the weight room, in the lunch room, <laughs> everywhere. 
And Tim made a pretty bold prediction, Troy. We've talked about our expectations for the season. I picked them to go 11-6 and six, just looking at the schedule. Same for you, right? 11-6. And, and these expectations are not being tampered down by the players out at Dove Valley. Listen, the last few years, they probably had delusions of adequacy. They were hoping to reach the playoff. When hope is your strategy, you typically don't succeed. Now they are talking in terms of what, Lionel? Tim Patrick said, it's Super Bowl or bust. He said, I don't want to be the team that says, oh, we got a new coach. We've got a new quarterback. We've got a new system. Play the victim. No, they have Russell Wilson. They have Nate Hackett. They have the weapons. They can succeed. And he put it out there, Super Bowl or bust. Tim, good for you. Put the onus and the accountability on this players because anything less than a postseason berth is unacceptable. So another week of OTAs in practice this week, and then what, Troy? What's on the plate for the Broncos as we hit summer? Well, basically, they have practice this week, and then the big one is the mandatory minicamp. That is the 13th through the 15th. That's where they kind of put all the pieces of the puzzle together. You want to be feeling good about yourself. You want to be feeling good about the competition. As you leave for essentially a five-week break, you want that positivity, and you want especially the offensive players to feel good because they're going to meet up with Russell Wilson and we know that at some point before training camp. But that mandatory mini camp, that's where we need to get a glimpse and see, okay, this is who we think this team could be early in the preseason and why, frankly, we think they're going to get off to a fast start. Because for me, Lionel, they could go 7-1 in those first eight games. Gosh, that would be a change, wouldn't it? <laughs> All right, one more thing. We are into round two of the bids for ownership of the Broncos, Troy. What is the latest on who might be sitting in the owner's box at Empower Field at Mile High from the home opener September 18th against the Texans. The expectation, Lionel, is that we will see the second round of bidding this week, and that could be the final round of bidding. We'll see how this plays out. But the front runner for me has remained Rob Walton of Walmart fame. He has got the most money. He could make this happen if it goes, let's say, to $5 billion. But then you go to Josh Harris. He owns the Devils and the 76ers. He's got a great group that includes Magic Johnson. You also have Jose Feliciano. He's in a group that could put together enough money as well. And then finally, Matt Ishbia, he played college basketball at Michigan State, so you know he loves sports. But Walton, for me, is the front runner. And in talking to a source about this, they would be surprised if this is not settled by July so that we could have a new owner in place for training camp. All right, Troy, great stuff as always. And that's it from Denver 7 right now. Alexis, let's go back to you. Still to come on Broncos Country Connected, mascot coordinator Brad Post shares some insight into the huge impact Miles makes on game day. Broncos Country Connected is presented by Carpet Mill Outlets. Bigger discounts, better selections. The greatest achievement for me would be my football career. One man anchored the greatest defense Denver has ever seen. Randy was a playmaker. Randy was very smart. Hear his story. I believe I was blessed with a, an athletic ability. Experience his career. That guy's a absolutely a Hall of Famer. It's a travesty that he's not in. It just is. Randy Gratishar, the heart and soul of the Orange Crush, premieres June 28th on Denver 7. Welcome back to Broncos Country Connected. Since making his debut in 2001, Miles has been an integral part of the game day experience at Empower Field at Mile High. From wild stunts to perfectly executed chest bumps, Miles is never too far from the action. Since we can't hear straight from the horse's mouth, mascot coordinator Brad Post shares some of the subtle and not so subtle ways Miles leaves a lasting impression with Broncos fans of all ages. A mascot coordinator is pretty much the sort of behind the scenes of, of the program. I'm responsible for scheduling miles, uh, billing, budgeting, taking care of props and costumes. Basically everything that's not being a super fun mascot is the coordinator job. The traits of a good mascot are energy. You always want to bring the energy, make sure uh, people are having a good time. Engagement, 
uh, being able to go out and, and engage with the, the fan base. And any Broncos fan would, would love a piece uh, of, of the players as far as like their time and their attention. And it's just, it's just not possible. And to be fair, it's, it's not possible for every fan to have a piece of Miles either, but he's just a little bit more available. It's a great tool for the team to, uh, again, sort of make that connection between the fans and, and the club. The mascot itself is, is sort of the bridge between the fans and the team. Broncos fans, welcome back to Empower Field at Mile High. Miles arrives early, between 9 and 10 a.m. Miles' kind of first appearance is out in the parking lots for tailgate stuff. And then um, there's a couple spots he hits. We started a new tradition this year where we greet the fans coming off the light rail and we meet on the pedestrian bridge on the east side. And uh, we've got the drum line and we've got cheerleaders and Miles is there. Then we kind of all march to Main Street where cheerleaders perform and the band plays and, and we throw out t-shirts and it's just kind of convergence of all the fans. We're trying to get everybody together and try to get everybody excited for game day. Then he moves inside and uh, we're hoping that we can bring back uh, mini miles and then they'll go out for team warm-ups uh, and then it's time for team intros. Hands on your feet for your 2021 Denver Broncos. It's full bore from there, and during the game is, is when his real job uh, kind of starts and following the game and, and trying to direct fans and create some noise on third down for the, for the defense and celebrating touchdowns, which we'll be doing a lot more this year. There's lots of times where I think you'll see uh, Miles kind of directing the fans to cheer, uh, but there's also times when uh, Miles is sort of taking direction from the fans as well. I think they feed off of each other. When it comes to halftime, you know, a lot of times, especially for fans, that's their, their chance to sort of take a break and go get some refreshments. Miles also enjoys uh, a nice halftime break, but not all the time. So uh, there's plenty of times where he's involved with halftime. Uh, a lot of times that's with the cheerleaders. He's involved in, in the dancing and, and the production there. Sometimes it's a cool appearance with uh, celebrities like uh, this last year we had uh, Flo Rida come out um, and Miles perform with them uh, along with the cheerleaders and dancers and stuff so I think the Broncos do a great job of providing unique uh, acts and, and opportunities uh, to entertain the fans at halftime. After halftime, brief break. Uh, and then it's back out there, you know, third quarter, uh, get the fans riled up again, get everybody back into the rhythm and back into the game and making noise and, and helping out the defense. And then uh, at the beginning of the fourth quarter, this year we started a new tradition where Miles climbs the mountain and then uh, shows up on the top of the scoreboard with the fourth quarter flag and let everybody know that it's the beginning of the fourth quarter and we're gonna need all their help to close out the game. Unfortunately, there is no elevator uh, to the top of the scoreboard, so uh, I think it's about seven flights of stairs. The clock can be running, the clock can be stopped, so a 15-minute quarter, uh, that could go pretty quickly or it could be pretty long, so you always have to kind of have that in the, in the back of your head, and, and, and Miles has always got to be uh, Johnny on the spot for uh, the fourth quarter. One of Miles's best moments uh, was it was a Monday night and The Rock was there to kind of kick everything off. So he was down on the field uh, getting everybody pumped up. And it... What? You're right. Uh, so Miles says that his best moment uh, was actually the DT chest bump. DT had scored and it was in the uh, south end zone and pointed right at Miles and, and came up and gave him a big chest bump. That's pretty special. Again, that, now that DT's gone, probably even, probably even more special. But anytime you get uh, an interaction on the field with, with the players, uh, you know, they're just as pumped up as, as Miles is and, and that gives him a little extra punch. Like there was another great one where TJ Ward had an interception and, and he uh, came swung around and, and spotted Miles from 20 yards away and gave him the point. He's like, we're going up, we're doing the hip bump and gave Miles a hip bump. Uh, Aqib Talib would always give Miles the, the, the triple clap. But yeah, that, the chest bump with DT has is, is, uh, is got to be up there.
I think Miles is a fan favorite because he is also a fan. In some sense, uh, every, every fan has their own individual journey, how they became Broncos fans and, and how the Broncos fit into their life. A lot of people's memories uh, with their families and, and friends and important people in their life uh, are attached to, uh, to the Broncos in some way or another, you know, whether that was going to their first game or, you know, the first Broncos Super Bowl or, um, you know, a certain player that came to the Broncos. Uh, those things have a very special meaning to people beyond just football. People connect with Miles because he loves the team just like they do. Looking forward to seeing what shenanigans Miles is already planning for this upcoming season. Coming up on Broncos Country Connected, learn more about how the Broncos are giving back to our Colorado community through their annual day of service. Don't go anywhere. He's the biggest prankster I, I ever run into in my life. Sometimes you felt like the butt of the jokes. He would unscrew the shower head, spray an icy hot product into the undergarment. You start feeling this heat. I certainly said, no, that wasn't me. I didn't do that. Grabbed the snake real quick, held it up in his face, and I go, the prank's over. Pretty special time for me. Randy Gratishar, the heart and soul of the Orange Crush, premieres June 28th on Denver 7. Thanks for sticking with us for this final segment of Broncos Country Connected. The Denver Broncos strive to improve lives in our community all year round. But there's one day a year when staff, players, corporate partners, and fans come together to make a difference during the Denver Day of Service. On Friday, the Broncos and Mile High United Way led 28 community projects while supporting 23 nonprofit organizations. Here's a look back at the impact they were able to make by providing meal kits for those who need them most here in Colorado, thanks to the U.S. Hunger Project. Last year, the United Way took over 150,000 phone calls from community members, our families, our neighbors saying, we need some help. We need some help putting food on the table. So today is about doing just that. We are gonna be able to say at the end of today, we fed 40,000 families in Colorado. We believe that by coming together that we can make a really big impact. So we work with volunteers all across the country to create these massive meal pack events. So today we had the pleasure of working with nearly 250 people from the Denver Broncos community that decided to step up and really help their neighbors in need. So today we packaged 40,000 meals and all of those are going to be staying local to the community, which is always such a beautiful thing to see. A lot of the season ticket holders, fans, sponsors uh, were here having a good time for a great cause, uh, Mile High, United Way, and also uh, U.S. Hunger. Uh, they you know, really put together a great event. It was a lot of fun, worked up with sweat. I had on hair nets, <laughs> but it was, it was a great time, uh, great time for the community and the Broncos to bond and continue to build that relationship. And uh, yeah, the community showed up well and we had, had a lot of fun. We're so grateful to be here at this event that the Broncos put on um, packaging meals for families in need in our community. Currently in Colorado, one in eight people struggle with hunger. And for us, it's a huge mission for us to help end hunger as part of our zero hunger, zero waste commitment. And so to be able to do that with the great partners like the Broncos and everybody else who is here volunteering was really a great experience. Community service is nothing new to the Denver Broncos. Um, they knew a few years ago, they decided they wanted to focus on food insecurity, um, looked us up. They were so excited to see that our missions aligned. Food insecurity doesn't have a standard uniform stapled look anymore. It could be your neighbor. It could be someone that you work alongside with that you think in your head that, hey, we're going through the same exact thing. And you know, there might just be one paycheck away and you don't know what their circumstances are. What we've learned through going through all of our data from our recipients is that food insecurity is just one small part of it. Um, typically there are so many other things going on, whether they're struggling with affordable housing or education, really just food insecurity is just one part of it. So with Colorado, um, we've realized that one in eight people suffer from food insecurity. So when you think about that, just you know, walking through the store and one in eight people are in that situation of not sure where that next meal is coming from or how they're gonna pay the bills to 
sacrifice what is it going to be the medication this month or food next week I mean what's going to give um, it's really really important that we have community members step up to package those meals we look at the group here and it is the stadium staff it's it's the it's the staff from down in Dove Valley and then you get the the fans there's fans here that just want to give back to the community and it's really special that we're all doing it together we're all here at an assembly line kind of making these meals for those that need them. The Denver Broncos have always led the way and you can just look behind us and see the volunteers, the, the staff, the players that said, we know there are needs in our community and we are literally gonna unite and feed our community 40,000 meals today. I feel like sometimes when it comes to volunteerism, when they think 40,000 meals, they're like, oh, that's too daunting. That's a, that's a week's worth of work right there. And it really isn't just with 250 people just stepping up in a little under an hour, we want to make this impact happen. So really nothing is too small, nothing is too big. Um, really just reach out to your local areas to see how you can get volunteered and get involved in your community. I saw people building friendships uh, while packaging the boxes and having a good time. And then obviously the people who will receive this food on the, on the, on the back end, uh, you know, so many uh, families were fed last year because of Mile High United Way. And uh, we doubled the number that we did last year, this year. You know, it's just, just a great feeling to be involved with an organization that cares so much about the community. Honestly, you come to these things, you leave feeling really good about it. You hear the stories, you know, it kind of saddens you, but it makes you feel good that you can help. And it feels like, you know, every time I leave, I want to do more. So, you know, I, I definitely personally feel a benefit um, from every time I do these events, I just want to do more and give back. I think my biggest takeaway is the generosity of Coloradans. When we are in need, this community steps up. 200 people came out to say, we want to be a part of this. How lucky we are to live in Colorado, to have the Denver Broncos and to be the home of the United Way. Throughout the Denver Metro, more than 500 people participated in Denver's Day of Service, totaling 1,236 volunteer hours and an economic impact of more than $37,000, all in a day's work. Thank you to everyone who participated, and thank you for watching Broncos Country Connected. We'll see you same time, same place next week. Broncos Country Connected is brought to you by Ford Trucks. Built better, built stronger, built Ford tough.